Hello, I'm Peter Lee. I'm Corporate Vice President for Research and Incubations at Microsoft. Uh, my role and responsibility at Microsoft is uh, to be the leader of the research division at Microsoft, uh, called Microsoft Research, as well as uh, new research-powered lines of business and products. And I'm really pleased and honored to be speaking with you today. It's such an exciting time in science and technology. There are many things coming over the next five to 10 years you know, new advances in silicon, uh, new hybrid interaction experiences, uh, incredible medical advances, maybe even the first quantum computing capabilities and more. But out of all of those, probably the most profound changes and advances will be in artificial intelligence. Indeed, it seems likely that AI will be a fundamental enabler of everything else that happens in science and technology over the coming decade. Now, before diving in, I wanted to get clear on what we mean when we say AI, especially when we say AI today. We don't know too much about the nature of this thing that we call intelligence, but when we say artificial intelligence, we're talking about the study of machines that exhibit whatever this is, uh, this thing that we call intelligence. But in today's tech industry, when people say AI, 99 times out of 100, what they actually mean is machine learning which is the study of machines that improve with experience. And not just machine learning in general, but specifically machine learning based on digital data. In other words, where the experience that the machine learns from and improves from is essentially the digital exhaust of human intelligence and activity. It's been important to note that the data has to be labeled. In other words, if we wanted, say, to train an AI system to recognize the objects in a photograph, we would need lots of photographs labeled with the words that describe the objects in it. Such labeling is really difficult and expensive as it depends on human labor and intelligence. But over the past three or four years, a profound change has happened, a change that has allowed a shift away from a dependence on labeled data, something that we call weakly supervised or unsupervised machine learning. Now, how does that work? To understand this, Let's take an example from natural language processing. Consider this simple fill in the blank test. In linguistics, these tests are called closed tests. Now we can train a machine learning model to compute the most likely answers to this kind of test problem. But note, there's a trick. If we can have the system create its own test problems, then because of that, the system can also grade the accuracy of its own outputs. So if the machine can make lots and lots of test problems simply by scooping up text and then just blanking out the words arbitrarily, it can then use those tests to grade itself and improve the accuracy of its machine learned model. In this setup, very little human intervention is needed. And in fact, no labeling by human beings is needed at all. It's almost as though we're learning through testing where you get to make up your own test questions. What a wonderful thing that is. The real implication though, is that this is the basis of a new kind of machine learned model called a neural transformer. And these transformers today are getting big. And I mean, really big. We talk about the size of these neural transformer models in terms of the number of parameters which loosely speaking, you can think of as a count of the number of virtual neurons in the system. There is in fact, a kind of arms race going on in the tech industry right now, pursuing ever increasing scale. And this is happening because so far we are finding that the capabilities of these large neural nets keep getting better and better as they get bigger. Of course, doing this requires huge investments in computing infrastructure. But when you read about the big language models, like OpenAI's GPT-3 or Google's T5 or Microsoft's Turing Megatron, what we are talking about are these neural transformer models and they're getting very big. The public disclosure has Microsoft's Turing Megatron at 530 billion parameters. And that's just the public disclosure. All of these companies and more have larger ones that are probably not publicly disclosed. Now, a key feature of these transformer models is that they can be used as the foundation for training more specialized models fairly easily and cheaply. 
This is partly why Stanford University scientists recently used the term foundation models to describe them. In fact, the Turing Megatron model is now powering well over 100 different new AI features spanning almost every Microsoft product. For example, here on this screen, you can see some output from our product, Azure Text Analytics for Health. It's capable of understanding an unstructured medical note, working at how different keywords and phrases relate to one another, and then completing the practical task of ensuring the right billing codes are extracted. As another example, our GitHub division has made a product integration of OpenAI's GPT-3 foundation model to produce a new specialized machine learning model called Codex. Codex powers GitHub's new Copilot product. Copilot understands the comments that computer programmers are writing when they're writing their computer codes and automatically writes the computer code for complete methods and functions. The early users are just loving Copilot. In fact, the software developers on my team who are using it claim that it both makes them more productive and up levels their thinking. Some of them even call it magical. But these kinds of product applications are just barely scratching the surface of what they're capable of. The emerging capabilities have really surprised us along with many other scientists around the world. Consider this little riddle. Here, we see that the Turing Megatron model at Microsoft in yellow provides not only the answer to the riddle, but when prompted can also explain line by line the reasoning that it used. And here you see in yellow the exact output that Turing Megatron gives us when we ask, how did it come up with an answer to this riddle? Looking at this and so many other examples hints that these large models may actually understand ideas, intentions, and aspects of how the world works. This ability to transfer knowledge and capabilities from one application domain to another is really impressive. But equally important and impressive is their multimodal capabilities. For example, the Turing Megatron and GPT-3 models today align both text across all languages and images in the same vector space. So instead of separate models for image processing tasks versus language tasks, they are handled in a deeply integrative way in a single model. So for example, if you use the Edge web browser, Turing Megatron is used uh, to understand both the language and the images in web pages to smartly improve the quality of the images you see. Here on the right, you can see the Edge web browser showing uh, images for a particular shopping website. And this is compared to the uh, web page image on the left, which doesn't benefit from uh, the Turing Megatron super resolution model. These models today are going well beyond language to integrate knowledge of what they, uh, they can see, what we can see and capture visually in the world. For an even whizzier example, our partners at OpenAI have been experimenting with the capabilities of their GPT-3 model, for example, to take complex natural language requests for images and then automatically generate them in a system called DALL-E. Here, I've asked DALL-E to give me a surrealist painting of a tech executive giving a keynote about digital simulation. I think this completely original painting I came up with is pretty nice. And it's been really amazing at, uh, to, to watch the rapid progress of the DALL-E system and the underlying GPT-3 model on which it's based. All right, so what does this all have to do with simulation. Well, here we see two animations of a modeling of a protein called chignolin. On the left is the animation derived from a numerical model. As you can see, it doesn't go very far. And the reason for that is that a chemically precise model of this type of complex molecule would actually take hundreds, perhaps thousands of years of computing time on even a very large supercomputer. But on the right is a complete fold of the protein done with chemical precision. And it was computed in just a few weeks in our labs through the use of machine learning using a large neural transformer model for graph learning called a graphformer. A graphformer is a deep attention model for molecular representation learning with carefully designed structural encoding to reflect the topological relationship, the structural importance, in the edge context in the molecular graph. 
This use of big AI enabled us to simulate the dynamics of this protein with chemical accuracy for the first time, corresponding to a 10 million fold speed up as compared to the traditional scientific computing numerical methods. In fact, there is an emerging revelation that this computing pattern, this pattern that underlies popular numerical methods used in scientific computing and simulation is susceptible to deep learning. Or to put it another way, that transfer learning effects and multimodality may lead to significant improvements across a wide range of scientific computing problems. For mesh-based methods, the major computation is to multiply a super large sparse matrix with a dense vector a very large number of times. The sparsity stems from the mesh structure, so each multiplication corresponds to a linear neighborhood aggregation operation over the mesh. As a result, such multiplication is similar to a convolution layer if the mesh is structured, and similar to a graph convolution layer in the neural net if the mesh is unstructured. And for mesh-free methods, or Lagrangian methods, the major computation is to calculate pairwise interactions amongst particles, which is similar to calculating attentions amongst tokens. Regardless of whether the problems are mesh-based or mesh-free, it appears increasingly likely that machine learning can be a new underlying technology for large-scale scientific computing and digital simulation. And if this works out, it may have a profoundly transformative effect on a range of science and technology areas. In conclusion, we have little doubt that we are on the cusp of a major revolution in the capabilities of AI to extract useful insights and human assistance from large amounts of unstructured multimodal data. But what we ask today is what the combination of big AI and simulation technology might mean for scientific discovery. You know, thousands of years ago, the paradigm of scientific discovery was largely empirical based on observations of natural phenomena. Of course, this later entered a second paradigm of discovery, the theoretical domain, based on mathematical models and principles of generalization. And about 50 years or so ago, science entered a third paradigm of computational science in which complex phenomena are simulated numerically. Today, of course, we are well into a fourth paradigm of science as stated by Jim Gray, based on big data exploration that synthesizes both theory and computation through simulation. But maybe, just maybe, simulation and big AI may combine to create a new paradigm of discovery, a fifth paradigm that enables computationally accelerated simulation and empirical observation at time and special scales never before possible. Imagine being able to simulate not just single proteins, but perhaps in the future whole cells with quantum fidelity or to solve combustion, containment, and aerodynamics design problems with true precision that advances our fusion power aspirations, or to accelerate the search for catalysts critical for taking carbon out of the atmosphere more effectively and cheaply, or to extract insights and hypotheses from the petabytes of data streaming out of large scientific apparatus, such as the Large Hadron Collider, and more. It's such an exciting time to be a part of this field and I'm so pleased to have this opportunity to share these thoughts with you. Thank you.